It's a big club, and you ain't in it. <laughs> you and I are not in the big club. So, I've covered some games that were controversial for their time, like Manhunt 2 and Bully. But this is the first title I've scrutinized that could be considered almost more contentious in retrospect. State of Emergency is a third-person beat-em-up in the vein of Dynamite Cop and Fighting Force. Developed by Viz Entertainment and published by Rockstar Games, the game was distributed for the PS2 in February of 2002, with an Xbox and Windows port released a year later. Hard on the heels of the smashing success that was Grand Theft Auto 3, released the year prior, the developers were keen to try and capitalize on the controversy of Rockstar's legendary 3D sandbox. They even used a clever marketing gimmick in the form of a sticker printed on the box that implies that the shop employee must check your ID prior to purchase, giving State of Emergency that dangerous forbidden vibe meant to grab your attention. This, combined with the flashy cover art, replete with the big yellow Rockstar logo, flames, and the mean mug and Latino, Spanky, definitely helped to draw people in. But beyond the flash gimmicks, was there any substance? State of Emergency is set in the United States of America, and so the tale goes. An economic crisis in the year 2023 has weakened the US government. Now this is the type of ludicrous fiction that I appreciate in my video games. <laughs> this economic collapse allows the American Trade Organization, a thinly veiled parody of the World Trade Organization, to form a paramilitary group that overthrows the government and establishes a police state. Several years later, a resistance group of Maquis wannabes assembles. Creatively named Freedom, this group of fighters instigate nationwide riots. The Big Bad Corporation declares a state of emergency and that's it. That's literally it. Odale! You play as one of five characters, progressively unlocked over the course of the campaign, all new recruits to freedom, proving their worth and fighting back against the man or whatever. The only background you're given for each character is the brief blurb on the character selection screen. The group Freedom is believed responsible for a deadly jailbreak last night at a corporation maximum security prison for political offenders. Among the suspects released was one Edward the Bull Raymond, a one-time political activist and leader. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Bull Raymond, please contact the corporation at once. You want it? Come on! Cutscenes are minimal, to say the least. A few flashes of gameplay footage set to narration by a female broadcaster is about all you get. Missions are delivered via text boxes without any voice acting. Every time you finish a level, some random dude from Freedom congratulates you. This is literally the final cutscene, your happy ending. This is an emergency bulletin from Corporation News Central in Capital City. The corporation has suffered a devastating loss at the hands of freedom. We'll try to stay on the air as long as possible. Citizens are advised... Oh my God! 
Listen up, people. The time to rise up is now. The revolution will be televised. You know what we're talking about. We're taking to the streets and pushing the enemy out. Let's show them what freedom is all about. It's time for democracy again. No more corporate slogans. No more logos. The flames of freedom are spreading. It's time for you to join the cause. Okay, so now what? You've destroyed your own cities and killed hundreds of your fellow citizens, leaving you to live in a lawless dump of your own doing. And once the warlords and the criminals take advantage, you get to truly live out your communistic utopian fantasy, which is the one where you go hungry and find someone else to blame for all your problems. Oh! Oh! Where were the vipers? Initially in development for the Sega Dreamcast, it was determined that the target audience for a game like State of Emergency was largely going to be found on the PS2, especially after the success of Grand Theft Auto 3. Converted from an action strategy game early on, the team shifted focus and decided to make the game an action-packed riot simulator where the screen would be filled with as many characters as possible, and not only that, but each character would have intricate AI programming, allowing for more sensical route-finding behavior. The team at Viz developed a PS2 renderer that would take advantage of the relationship between the PS2's main CPU, the Emotion Engine, and the GPU, which consisted of two vector units which allow for complex data processing without big memory latency issues. This optimization and balance between CPU and GPU allowed the complex AI behavior to work in tandem with the rendering. What this means in simple terms is that the player could see up to 100 characters on screen at once carrying out riotous behavior without a dip in performance. Given the age of the hardware this game was developed on and how far games have come since, playing through State of Emergency again 20 years later is still quite impressive on a technical level. There are a lot of clever illusions that work well to maintain the impression of an entire city block filled with people embroiled in the goings-on. If you look out, you can notice minimally rendered character models that begin to fill in as they get closer to the player, for instance. Tricks like this help to maintain a stable frame rate, and as a result, despite the madness, the game ran without any significant slowdown or pop-in. There's also a really nice balance of NPCs being interactable without getting in your way. You can pummel them and take their weapons, but you can run right through crowded city streets without getting stalled. They'll even get caught in the crossfire as the bad guys attempt to hose you down. This adds to the bloody paroxysm, which is actually highly effective as an escape strategy as well, having these little meat shields running around in front of you. I also appreciate how each character has their own move animations and they all have little subtle touches, seen here with Spanky's grapple animation, or here where you see him hold his pistol sideways during battle. There are designs that give a little extra lifeblood to the world as well, like this coach bus being stitched up along the side paneling and the drying remnants of human vitality right next to the bullet holes. And although the level architecture is incredibly simple, I very much love the diverse array of colors on screen. State of Emergency just pops. As much as I love Grand Theft Auto 4, it's easily my favorite GTA game, it's very drab and washed out, and although this is tonally appropriate given the sobering, gritty plotline, playing the game recently and then playing State of Emergency, the splash of hue was really appreciated. Sadly, the same praise cannot be heaped onto the sound design. Oh. Take him down. This just in. Capital City Mall is the scene of a deadly siege. All right, this won't take long. In short, the audio design in State of Emergency is there, but barely. Voice acting is limited to a few lines on the character selection screen, a random member of the Freedom Group, the female news broadcaster, and the hollering from NPCs in the world. The sound of chaos is done pretty well, with shouts and shrieks and the occasional helicopter flyover. The illusion of a large-scale riot is held up sonically, but the sound effects are very stock. 
Machine guns and explosions are straight from the big library of sound effects, and you hear the same handful of panicked NPCs in every level. The music flat out sucks. It's extremely generic, and it sounds like something out of an old SmackDown game on PS1. In summary, given the for its time highly impressive graphics technology, the sound design in State of Emergency is shit. Son of a bitch! So, the story doesn't mean a whole lot in State of Emergency, and that's fine. Nobody plays Mario for the storyline either. The problem is, Mario is actually fun to play. Oh. The gameplay in State of Emergency is as follows. It's a beat-em-up, and well, you beat stuff up. What separates this game from a multitude of others in the same genre is the ongoing riot during each level. Everywhere you look, dozens of civilians run amok. Some carry stolen goods, some are just fleeing to safety. Mixed into the mess are gangsters from various sets, police squads, and occasionally special agents and military personnel akin to the National Guard. Combat is broken up between hand-to-hand -hand fighting, melee weapons, and the use of various firearms and explosives. Hand-to-hand -hand is standard beat-em-up fare, you have a punch, you have a kick, and a couple of combos. A power attack, as well as a grapple attack, and a wake-up attack. Melee weapons have an appreciable variety. Everything from nightsticks to baseball bats, hatchets, cleavers, stereo equipment, stools, sandwich signboards, rubbish bins, cigarette stand ashers, and even park benches are up for grabs. Running around bashing opponents is snappy, it's pretty impactful and it's satisfying, and edged weapons have the ability to lop off heads in the heat of battle. You can even beat up people with a severed, charred arm, which is so over the top and ludicrous that the brutality is basically nullified. Firearms are just as diverse and are mostly good fun to use. Popping off shots with the pistol is okay, but it's definitely underpowered. Get down on the ground! And I'd rather snag a baton or a hatchet, but everything else is super punchy and gratifying. We'll tear your soul apart. The shotgun, especially in close quarters, is particularly brutal and destructive. The Uzi, Kalashnikov, and M16 are all reliable and appropriately devastating. Then we have some heavy duty stuff. Weapons like the rocket launcher are, no pun intended, a blast to let rip into a crowd as well as into a building and then watching the explosive aftermath come bellowing out of the windows. You can wield a gas grenade launcher, which is kind of cool. It's classic weaponry that you'd associate with the subject matter. Then you have the minigun. Showering the bad guys with 762 at 4,000 rounds per minute and watching the meat grinder before you is pretty gnarly, but in gaming, there are few things more satisfying than this. So, the weapons are all pretty solid, but this game desperately needed a lock-on mechanic. Sprinting ahead and snapping R2 to focus towards enemies works, but just so. <laughs> oh yeah, and by the way, there's a small plot point about a corporate doctor offering free inoculations. As it turns out, they were putting microchips into those injections. You know, I really miss the days when this was a silly plot in a video game, and not something strangers fervently argued about over the internet. Also, it's impossible that such a corporate doctor exists. 
We got Jeff Star. We got Jeff Star. Anyway, State of Emergency's campaign mode, titled Revolution, takes place over the course of four levels Capital City Mall, Chinatown, the East Side, and Corporate Central. Each level has a series of missions doled out by freedom contacts scattered about the map. Simple enough. The problem is, the missions are incredibly repetitive. Each mission across every level spanning the entire duration of the game are as follows. A mission where you have to retrieve something like weapons, medical supplies, or a file. A mission where you destroy a business. A mission where you escort an NPC. A mission where you assassinate someone or attack a stronghold. Or a mission where you defend a position. This is it. The entire time. At first, I was so pumped to play this game again, as I remember thinking it was incredible as a kid in 2002. But the luster quickly turned into rust as the reality of the boring, ultra-repetitive mission structure became evident. I must say, as repetitive as they are, I never really got tired of missions that asked you to destroy property or assassinate targets. To be fair, those were always mindless, simple fun. And watching an explosion knock down a building tapped into that unevolved primal dum-dum spot in my brain. I can't lie. These missions were pretty good. Then you have the escort missions. The amount of vile, filthy words that came streaming from my mouth during these missions would have Liam Gallagher blushing. These missions are unbearable and really tainted my nostalgia for this game beyond repair. The goals themselves are very simple and involve a variation of take me here and protect me while I do a thing. Fine, but these milksop weaklings have tiny little health bars and are oftentimes defenseless. Even when they have weapons, they still suck. Watching your delicate charge get surrounded and beaten to death as you're busy getting grapple locked is so infuriating that I can barely manage to find the words to describe such misery. Three mechanics would have mitigated this frustration. One, a solid lock-on mechanic as I mentioned earlier. Two, the ability to command your ally to hang back or to take cover. And three, the ability for your allies to pick up health like the player can. But none of this is possible, so fuck me, I guess. As I said, I did enjoy some of the missions. I liked squatting up with a group of thugs to attack a common threat, the enemy of my enemy as it were. These missions are solid, and I wish there had been more of this and less goddamn escorting. Oddly enough, the second level, Chinatown, was, for me anyway, much more manageable and quite a bit more fun. I sort of fell into a groove and didn't have much trouble with any particular mission. Although the missions were the same old same, it seemed like they were balanced and the objectives were spaced out a little bit better. I'd say the east side level is where the tedium started to set in and the game began to drag on, but it was when I got to the final level, Corporation Central, where I really began to lament this playthrough. The missions went way overboard with the meet character X here. Oh no, it's a trap. Defend character X against an onslaught of enemies with automatic weapons and so forth. In this footage, you can see a perfect example. I failed one ambush, fine, only to get the chance to play the exact same type of mission on the other side of town. And watch how corny this is. I protect the subway worker from the beatdown ambush, only to have military thugs inexplicably arrive to gun my guy down pronto with no chance to prepare. And if I want to try that mission again, I have to run all the way back, talk to my contact, and then hoof it all the way back to that spot. This mission structure, in conjunction with the monotonous requirement to run through subway footpaths, made this last level absolutely brutal to finish. Despite my frustrations with the mall and the various escort missions, this finale was about as fun as pulling a boulder up a sand dune. The last mission sees the player shoot a few rockets at the big bad corporate HQ and your reward is a brief cutscene that celebrates your self-aggrandizing massacre. Huzzah! Do the biff! Do the biff! One last gripe about State of Emergency's gameplay. 
The designs for the playable characters are all unique and memorable. I'd even reckon that some of you clicked on this video because you recognize the cover art. You probably don't remember Spanky's name, but the image stuck with you. This is all well and good, but it really kind of blows that they don't have unique stats, and it gives the player absolutely no incentive to use one character over another. Maybe the bull could be slower and deal greater damage. Libra could be hyper fast but have a smaller health pool. Freak could break into terminals on his own and not have to escort hackers. Spanky could have absorbed more damage, and maybe McNeil could have been the balanced starter character or, I don't know, have better firearms handling due to being a former cop. Something. Anything. But alas, I guess I'll just put my own fist in my butt, bitch. Look at my face! Look at my face! I'm doing double life for killing a man! You think I give a f about you?! So the campaign mode is about as deep as a sheet of corrugated cardboard and almost as fun to play with. But the game is redeemed to an extent by chaos mode, which lets the player take control of any unlocked character to play through various challenges like timed chaos, where the player is given a time limit to run around causing as much mayhem and destruction as possible to rack up the highest score. Think of it like a bloodier Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. It's fun to play alone, but this also makes for a phenomenal pass the controller multiplayer mode, seeing who can accrue the most points in the set time. It kinda reminded me a bit of Red Faction Guerrilla's Wrecking Crew multiplayer mode, a mode which by the way I highly highly recommend. There are other challenges as well, such as capping an army of cloned riot troopers with or without a time limit, which made for a fun little distraction. Again, I say that the campaign mode is pretty beat. But Chaos Mode is a blast, and if you can snag State of Emergency for under $10, this mode will give you some value. Get down on the ground! I distinctly remember my brother showing me State of Emergency back in 2003 when it came out for the Xbox. It was genuinely incredible to see the characters running around on screen doing their own little tasks, regardless of how simple they are. The game was so colorful and vibrant and over the top, and it still is. After State of Emergency, developer Viz Entertainment developed a few bad but good cult hits like Evil Dead Fistful of Boomstick and the 2005 version of NARC. I've never played the sequel, but by all accounts it was a massive bomb. I'd like to try it sometime out of sheer curiosity, but I don't have a copy so I don't know, maybe someday. Prior to release, politicians from the state of Washington officially denounced State of Emergency due to the similarities between the game and the 1999 World Trade Organization protests in Seattle, which cost the city millions of dollars in property damage. It's funny how they suddenly care when their interests are at stake, isn't it? <laughs> Some things never change. But the game launched as planned, and as of 2006, State of Emergency sold over 700,000 copies, and it raked in nearly $30 million. It's not a patch on the millions and millions of copies sold by its kindred digital spirit Grand Theft Auto 3, but solid nonetheless. And if nothing else, the game was a greater success than your average autonomous zone. <laughs> you serious? All in all, State of Emergency made a less than subtle statement about corporations taking over society and controlling everything around us. The media, our entertainment, what we're told to buy and who from, how to think, how to feel, and if you don't goose step along with the narrative, you'll be coerced. The game predicted this would occur in the faraway year of 2023. but. It seems the developers underestimated the true power of mass gullibility and corporate greed. 2023 has now come and gone, and when compared to the reality of the last couple of years, State of Emergency seems kind of… tame. Oh, and Siri, set an alarm to fight capitalism later. I'm not worried about it! I'm not worried about any of this! This 
so fucked up. Do what you want. Pull the plug.